Welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I'm your host, James Nave, always airing first on WPVMLP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville, heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song. WalterParks.com for more on Walter's music. Davine Dial, thank you for managing WPVM-FM in downtown Asheville. And Robin Collier, thank you for managing KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio, out of Taos, New Mexico. I really appreciate that. If you'd like to reach out to me, Nave at JamesNave.com. Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to remind you that we're sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you'd like to improve your writing chops, the imaginativestorm.com is a good place to, to go. Imaginativestorm.com. Today, my guest is Sally Cox. Sally is going to be one of the speakers on the TEDx Asheville stage coming up March 15th. Sally's focus is working in the Congo with bonobos. So I'm very excited to hear all about what Sally's up to. So Sally, welcome to Twice Five Miles Radio. And so let's start by having you tell us the name of your organization. Thank you so much, James. Uh, my organization is the Bonobo Conservation Initiative, bonobo.org. And our mission is for, to protect the endangered bonobos and their habitat in the Congo rainforest. So, Sally, the Congo is a long way from Asheville, and I just learned that you're an Asheville native. So what was it about growing up in Asheville that inspired you to go out and see the world? And the reason I'm asking this, we have a lot of listeners in Asheville and Taos and other parts of the world, and many of them are adventurers, and they go out and see the world somewhere before they departed there was a calling to go do that. When you were growing up, did you notice that calling early or did that happen later for you? I guess I always had an adventurous spirit and a bit of a wanderlust growing up. You know, I like doing exploring. I, I like traveling. But I think really the part of my Asheville upbringing that most connects to what I'm doing with my life was witnessing the environmental degradation. You know, Asheville is a beautiful, beautiful place. And as I was growing up in the 1960s and 70s, seeing the changes uh, from pollution. For example, I used to be able to see from my backyard, Mount Pisgah and the tower on top of Mount Pisgah. And then Gradually, you could not see the tower on Mount Pisgah, and then you couldn't see the mountain because the air pollution started getting so bad. So I was always very aware of, of what was starting to happen to our environment. You know, that really has been a driving force for my work to conserve the natural resources of our planet. <laughs> I remember when I was growing up in Asheville, it was in the 50s. And my grandfather would take me out Brevard Road, past where the parkway crosses Brevard Road now, and we would see the French Broad River. And during the 50s, the French Broad River was brown, and all of the foliage on both sides of the bank, brown, dead. And Ooh. there were islands of pollution floating in the river from the factories up toward Brevard and Rosman that dumped this really nasty stuff into the river. And I remember the other creeks like Hominy Creek, which was a much smaller tributary that fed into the French Broad, being so nasty and smelled so bad. When we were children, we would go to Hominy Creek and want to play in the creek, but we couldn't. It was completely, completely awful. That changed. And I also remember growing up in Asheville, the garbage along the sides of the road, because back then in the 50s and the 60s, people just rolled their windows down, tossed the trash yep. out and went on their merry way. Do you remember that trash on the sides of the road? I do. 
And then I remember Lady Bird Johnson's Keep America Beautiful campaign. Absolutely, I remember that. So tell us about your work with the Conservation Project and the bonobos. And tell us about the bonobos. You know, bonobos are great apes. They are our closest relative. We share almost 99% of the same DNA. The evolutionary line goes from monkeys to the great apes, which includes orangutans and gorillas and chimps and bonobos. But most people have never heard of bonobos. And yet they're so closely related to us and so much more human-like in certain ways and so different from our other close relative, the chimp. And that difference between the bonobos and the chimps is what really got my attention and inspired me to try to help them. What is the difference between the two? Well, chimpanzees, which you've all heard about from Jane Goodall's work, et cetera, chimps have a male-dominated society. They're competitive, top-down society. And chimps are the only primate besides humans that actually wage premeditated wars or conflicts with others of their own kind. And those are usually over territory and resources, just like most of our wars are fought over. But bonobos, on the other hand, are female empowered. They're a matriarchal society, more egalitarian. They are cooperative. They share resources and territory instead of fighting over them. And so in that way, bonobos and chimps almost represent like the yin and yang of human nature, the male and the female paradigm. The other distinguishing factor about bonobos, their anatomy is more human-like than the other, than chimps. Bonobos are also the only primate besides us that has sex, not just for procreation, but for recreation and pleasure. They also use it to bond and it's a way that they maintain the peace in their society. We have a really interesting model in our bonobo cousins that at this time in our own cultural evolution as a species ourselves, we would be wise to take a few cues from their playbook in order to save ourselves. Now, I'm thinking about the chimpanzees, the bonobos, humans. The chimpanzees have the aggressive territorial culture, and the bonobos have a more cooperative culture. We seem to go between the two, or do we? Are human beings more like the chimpanzees in terms of our natural inclination in the direction of territorial well, that's what the standard theories were, that that was our natural biology, that we were wired that way. And the truth is, when you add bonobos into the mix, we're equally related to bonobos and chimps in terms of evolution. You know, the line to humans, bonobos and chimps split off and from our common ancestor. So that's what I think is so fascinating. We do have that chimp hardwired competitive nature. We're also hardwired for cooperation. Our systems have been patriarchal, which is a chimp model. The patriarchy is not working so well these days. We need to learn to cooperate with each other, to share our resources, to stop fighting over them. Because right now we're in an existential crisis. We also have our bonobo nature to call upon. And I believe this is the time we need to do it. Well, this suggests to me that human beings have the capacity to make the choice. I will lean in the bonobo direction or the chimpanzees direction. The chimpanzees, do you think they're thinking about gee, maybe this isn't working out so well for us. Perhaps we should adopt bonobo ways. Then you have the humans. Are we the only ones who can make the decision between patriarchal and matriarchal? You know, the theory about why chimpanzees are competitive is that chimps have to compete with gorillas for food. So chimps share a habitat with gorillas. They, they live north of the Congo River along with gorillas and bonobos live south of the Congo River. I mean, that is a theory 
that bonobos don't have to compete so much for food and resources. So a more cooperative model can work better for them. Both species, bonobos are highly endangered. There's only 15,000 left in the wild. It's not even enough to fill Madison Square Garden. Chimps, there are over 200,000 left, but that's you know greatly reduced from what they used to be. I can't see bonobos ever wanting to shift to the chimp model. <laughs> Their model's working pretty well for them. Their major stress in life is humans and both species. You know, humans are the threat. You have brought the gorillas into the mix. So now we have the gorillas, the bonobos and the chimpanzees and the humans. How do the gorillas operate? Are they similar to the chimpanzees in terms of patriarchal top-down behavior? Or do they have a different approach to things? Well, gorillas are different. Um, they are male dominated. There's a, the silverback is the leader of each gorilla troop, uh, the ranking male. And he has a harem of females. There is some violence when another ranking male wants to become the ranking male. You know, gorillas are basically very peaceful. They're like the peaceful giants. They don't wage wars against other gorilla groups, whereas chimpanzees do. So so gorillas are different in that way. So I'm thinking of humans now. And ideally, we as humans, in a lot of the conversations I have, we think we have a choice from a species point of view. Maybe it comes from the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. The snake gives the choice and Eve takes the apple and bites from it. And the story goes on. And here we are today. I wonder, though, given all of your experience working with these species, do you think we have as much of a choice as we think? Or are we hardwired to behave the way we do in the same way that the gorillas are peaceful, the chimpanzees are territorial and wage war for the goof of it and the bonobos are more matriarchal and loving do we have any choices or are we fooling ourselves of course we have choices we have a lot of choices and we exhibit those i mean humans can be very cooperative humans can work together and thank goodness that we can once upon a time there were matriarchal human societies once upon a time, even the Christian beliefs got rewritten along the way when the patriarchy took hold. And now I believe what's happening is, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of pushback. The old patriarchal models simply aren't working for us anymore. Look at the Me Too movement. Females have gradually become more empowered in our society since the 1960s. There are female presidents in the world and there are free, many female leaders and females are gaining a lot more status. The difference between a patriarchal and a matriarchal model isn't just about male and female power in terms of I'm incarnated as a female today. Well, no, you have a female side too. You're a man, but we all have a male and female side to us in the terms of the paradigm of what those look like, the top-down, competitive, patriarchal way versus a more cooperative, collaborative, peaceful means of working out conflicts and so on. You know, bonobos, the females make alliances with each other, and that's how they maintain the, the power against the larger and more, you know, stronger males. So, you see that happening. I mean, I think the Me Too movement is a great example because females got together and said enough is enough. And here's what happened. We're exposing all this abuse that's been going on. And the males, you know, so many just tumbled like dominoes when that started to come out. That is a great example of the shifting in our culture today away from basically outdated patriarchal models more to an understanding that we need to operate differently. There's so many examples we could cite. I mean, look at the wars we have going on. How insane is that? I mean, what's going on with Ukraine, for example? You know, it's just blatant 
competition for basically power and resources. There's a different way of looking at power. I mean, in Bonobo society, the females have power, but they have power because they collaborate with each other. You know, power is more of a verb than a noun. The old competitive model we've been living with. I, I got to win. And if I win, you lose. Well, not necessarily. I mean, what we're looking for is a win-win situation. And that's what bonobos show us. They cooperate. They share territory. They share the food instead of fighting over it. One of the reasons I'm so interested in this, I've been having conversations with people about the intellect of creatures. Mm -hmm. And so often I've, and often people will say, oh, well, the humans are the top of the heap. The humans are the smartest. They're the intellectual ones. They are the rational ones. They can think things through. And that's all true. And yet I am beginning to think we may be overselling ourselves in terms of thinking we're on the top of the heap. When you've been working with these animals, have you given much thought to their ability to communicate the way they use their bodies, their, their sounds? Do you think they have languages? Do you think they're thinking more analytically than we give them credit for? There's no doubt they're highly intelligent and they do communicate with each other. No one's cracked the code yet of bonobo language, and it may or may not just be, it's not just verbal. I got into bonobos when I worked at National Geographic. I basically found my calling. And the first thing I did after I quit my job to go back to freelancing and, and following bonobos at that time was to spend a whole summer with the world's most famous bonobo, who is Kanzi. And Kanzi broke the language barrier. I mean, I, I say he's most famous, but still most people have never heard of Kanzi. And Kanzi, under the tutelage of Dr. Sue Savage Rumbaugh, a brilliant and creative scientist, demonstrated that bonobos can acquire and use human language if they're reared in environment in which it's extant. And that's what happened with Kanzi. They were trying to teach his mother, Matata, language using symbols uh, standing for words because bonobos, even though these bonobos tried to talk, they can't make consonant sounds because of the anatomy of their throats. So bonobos can't speak the way we do, but they can learn and use a sign language. And that's what happened. They were trying to teach Matata these lexigrams, that's what they call them, these symbols standing for words. And Kanzi was just two years old, little kid, you know, hanging around with his mom while the researcher trying to get his mom to learn this. And she wasn't very interested. And when they took her away to be bred, Kanzi, the very first day he was all alone, he used 12 words to ask for everything he wanted. And that was the eureka moment. And so he and then others in his family began to, you know, Dr. Sue Savage Rumbaugh was smart enough to see what was going on and incorporated the language into every aspect of their lives. Today, Kanzi is still alive. He lives in Iowa now. I've had a lot of time with him and other members of his family who also can use language. I mean, bonobos, they're as closest to us as you can get. It used to be that tool use was the the dividing line between humans and other creatures. And then when Jane Goodall discovered that chimpanzees make and use tools, it was then language was the dividing line. Well, now that line is blurred as well. So there's, you know, it's a very fuzzy line uh, that between us and, and the bonobos and the chimps. What's gone on with ape language research? Probably most people have heard of Coco the gorilla who used ASL, and she definitely could use language also. Um, but Kanzi's the top of the heap in that regard. And it seems that bonobos have a, more of a facility for language, perhaps. So you've traveled to Africa 
to visit and work with these animals. The Congo, is that where they are? Yes. <clears throat> Bonobos only live in one country in the world, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's right in the middle of Mother Africa. Equator goes right through it. It's a huge country about the size of Western Europe. And bonobos live in the Congo rainforest south of the Congo River, some of the most remote and biodiverse territory left on the planet. That's where they live in the world's second largest rainforest. One of the things people may not know if they haven't spent any time looking at the map of Africa, there's a map that you can find online. You can Google it. How many countries will fit in, or how many continents will fit into the continent of Africa? And you said um, Congo is the size of Western Europe. You can fit the United States, China, Western Europe, India, Russia, and a few other uh, continents and countries into Western Africa before you fill it up. So that's how big that place is. So what was it like for you going to the Congo? Did you struggle? Did you find it easy? You're along the hottest part of the world, along the equator. It's not cool along the equator. What was it like? And what were the politics like? Uh, the very first time I went to Congo was then Zaire, 1994. Getting there is quite an ordeal. On that particular trip, we took three bush plane rides and then drove in a very rundown vehicle on very almost impassable roads uh, to get to where the bonobos were. Um, so it's even today, you know, the only way to get to the sites where we work in the DRC, it's Democratic Republic of Congo, is either by river or by bush plane. And then usually motorcycles because there's no infrastructure. But what happened was uh, in 1996, a civil war broke out in then Zaire and ousted the dictator Mobutu, who had been ruling the country for over 30 years. And that's when the country changed to be the Democratic Republic of Congo and began having democratic elections. So the country has seen some of the most devastating uh, conflict in the world. The Congo War, which went on between 1996 and 2003, uh, took more than 50 million lives. That's more than any war since World War II. Tens of thousands of women were raped as a, as a weapon of war. And the devastation has been, you know, just horrible, just unimaginable. But most of the conflict in the DRC is in the Eastern Congo, which borders Rwanda and Uganda. And that's because most of the fighting and conflict is over the mineral wealth. You know, not only does the Congo contain about 70% of the, the Congo Basin rainforest, the second lung of our planet, along with the Amazon, you know, it's, but it also has all kinds of other resources, gold, cobalt, diamonds, uranium, you know, rare earth minerals, you name it, they've got it pretty much, copper. Uh, <clears throat> and those, those, that's what's really driving a lot of the conflict uh, in the East. Since the Congo, you know, the peace accord was achieved in 2003, um, we've been able to work in the habitat without any real problems because where the bonobos are, it's peaceful and it's been traditionally peaceful throughout history. But the Congo, I, I sort of think of it as the wild, wild west of Africa. <laughs> it's um, it's a wild country. And actually, I love it. I, it's my second home. And the thing that I did right off the bat that has made the most difference in my experience and in my work was I learned the local language. And the very first time I went to, to be with the bonobos, I was with Japanese researchers. Japanese actually were the first uh, primatologists to study bonobos in the wild, which is also part of the reason why people don't know about them. There wasn't a Jane Goodall or a Diane Fossey studying bonobos, and they were studied in the wild about a decade later than the other great apes. 
partly because they were so hard to get to. During that first trip in Wamba, I realized that I was fascinated with the local indigenous culture and the wisdom of that culture and the fact that if we're going to protect the bonobos, the only way and the best way is for the local indigenous people to be leading that effort. And as a matter of fact, the Mongandu people who live in Wamba have had taboos against hunting bonobos that have been passed down for generations. They have a lot of legends and stories, mostly about the relationship between humans and bonobos that have perpetuated these taboos. And so that was really the starting point for our philosophy and our work for conservation was that we need to work within the culture build on those traditions, work with the the local people to protect them. Fast forward has become the Bonobo Peace Forest, uh, which is a different model of conservation than the the old standard one. How did you manage to learn the local language and how long did it take you to do that? And at what point did you feel comfortable with your level of comprehension? Did you ever become fluent? I am fluent in Lingala. It's the it's the trade language. There are also there are over four hundred languages in the Congo. There and most Congolese speak at least three languages. So different from us Americans who speak one language usually. Um, but uh, actually, before I went on that very first trip, I was advised by the Japanese uh, primatologist I should try to learn a little Lingala. So I thought, my God, how am I going to learn Lingala? You know, there weren't exactly classes in it. Um, And so by calling and calling, I finally found this anthropologist, Dr. Alden Almquist, who had grown up part of his life in Zaire and had done his field work in anthropology in in the central Congo. uh, And he agreed to tutor me. So we went and copied every Lingala grammar in the Library of Congress, which was only about three. And he began tutoring me. And then when I went to Wamba, I did class every afternoon with kids and had kids teaching me, you know, and then Congolese friends back in the United States tutored me and I practiced. And um, it took a few years to really be able to speak it and understand it. Uh, And I'm always learning a little more even now, but it's made a huge, huge difference to be able to really communicate with the people who live in the forest uh, with the bonobos. Could you give us a sample of how you might say something? Olingina kolobanini. Yomoko ozaimoto. Ozaiko solana ngaisi koyo. Tozaiko solana bonobo. And translate that, please. <laughs> that was just, um, what did I just say? I just said, hi, it's, you know, it's great to talk to you. I'm happy to talk with you. You're a man that's on a radio. And I didn't really say a whole lot. Well, I was just curious to hear the music of the language. I love to hear yeah, the music of the language. You don't, I don't have to understand it to get a sense of its rhythm and how your face changed when you spoke the language. It's a different personality comes out when you speak another language. Yeah, it's a tonal language too. Like the word moto. Moto can mean fire, it can mean head, and it can mean person, depending on moto, moto, moto. So shifting a little bit here in this conversation and coming back to Asheville, you are one of the speakers for the TEDx Asheville event that's coming up March 15th, 2024. And I'm curious about what your subject is. I imagine it has something to do with bonobos. Tell me more about what you plan to do. I plan to talk about bonobos not only who and what bonobos are and what they have to teach us humans, um, but also how by emulating the bonobo way, the bonobo model in our work to protect them and the forest, we've actually pioneered a different model for conserving 
the Congo rainforest that's going viral on its own, that's self-replicating. And it's an integrated holistic model, very different than the old guns and guards, what they call fortress conservation. And it's done in cooperation with and empowering the local communities. How does that new culture work? What makes it work better than the guard culture? Well, we happened upon it organically because when we first started our work for conservation as the Congo War was beginning to wind down, we were looking at how can we protect our habitat because at the time, most of the bonobo habitat was designated as logging concessions. We did deep dive consultations with stakeholders in the Congo from the local people to scientists to political leaders to try to see how do we approach this problem. And we had the idea of a peace park, bonobos being a, an icon of peace in the war-torn Congo. And at that time, the country was split into three factions, three warring factions. And some people thought it would split into three countries. So we thought, well, maybe a transboundary you know, peace park because bonobos lived in all three of those areas. But the people said, no, we don't want another national park. Not another scenario where somebody somewhere else draws a boundary on a map and throws all the people out. And they're like, no, 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 this isn't going to work. People live here. And that was, of course, very much in keeping with our philosophy from the get-go. When we founded the Bonobo Conservation Initiative, we did so with a multidisciplinary group of really brilliant people to approach the problem a bit differently. We realized we wanted to work within the culture and we must work within the culture and address the threats to bonobos and their habitat, which is people. So that's how we developed our, our model, a network of community managed protected forests uh, that would be supported by sustainable development and led by the local communities. In our work, we started with basically just what we call information exchange, but talking with the local communities. Back then, we didn't even know where the bonobos were in any viable numbers, like where should we protect them? And the way we found out was by talking to the local people. They led us to the bonobos, and then we could send in the scientific teams to do the surveys in the forest and the mapping and all that. So we started on the ground. And now we've created two officially protected areas that span 9 million acres of rainforest. It's the size of Massachusetts and Rhode Island combined. And both of those protected areas started from the grassroots up. So we only work at the invitation of the local and indigenous people, and we work in partnership with them. The way our model started going viral was through that way of working with the people. So the reason why people are hunting bonobos is because the only commodity that they can sell and get to a market is smoked meat. You know, the infrastructure is so broken down that it might take somebody three weeks or a month to paddle or to walk or to ride a bicycle to a market where they can sell something. So agricultural crops won't last that long. So that's why, that's what's really driving the commercial bushmeat trade. And unfortunately, bonobos, even though we've been successful renewing taboos, having communities that didn't actually ascribe, there's always some mystique about bonobos. The different tribes or ethnic groups have their own traditions so in some cases, bonobos were hunted occasionally for ritual use, for fertility rituals and things like that. You know, most of the communities have always acknowledged the kinship between humans and bonobos. Through our consultations and partnership with the communities, we wanted to address their needs. They needed a health clinic. They wanted a college, an institute of higher education in their territory. So we founded a clinic health clinic. We founded the college. They needed help with microcredit programs. We supported women's groups, especially during the war. You know, a lot of women became widowed 
lost their husbands, their sons, and cooperatives of women came together and we've helped to support them. And of course, we really believe in empowering the women also. It's been that kind of organic give and take, and then providing a lot of training to the local people to do the science in the forest has led to where we are today. And what's happened is that Kogolo Pre Bonobo Reserve and the model for the Bonobo Peace Forest, other neighboring communities saw what we were doing there, participated in programs we were doing there, and they were inspired to form their own community organizations and start their own conservation projects. So in that way, the Peace Forest is actually self-replicating. And this is so different than the old model, which is really a top-down patriarchal model of conservation. The Rainforest Foundation in UK did a, an extensive study of the protected areas in Central Africa a few years ago. And they found that the traditional, what they call fortress conservation now, the guns and the guards, just simply wasn't working very well. In some cases, the biggest national park in the bonobo habitat, it was found that the park guards were actually teaming up with the bushmeat hunters and helping them, you know, and making some extra money that way. The best protector of these forests are the people who have been protecting them for generations. It's their land. They don't want people coming in and hunting all the animals out of their forest. We believe that this model is more sustainable in the long term. It sounds like the bonobos left alone need no help at all. The infrastructure around the bonobos is what needs to be saved. And once you build that infrastructure out with education and with other ways to make money and sustain, then the bonobos will go on their merry way doing what they've always done. Humans are really the only threat to bonobos besides disease or the occasional leopard. Bonobos do just fine on their own. That's the problem everywhere. Humans are the issue. And that's why a human-based approach is critical. And this is the, what I'm talking about in this kind of paradigm shift. I mean, 25 years ago, our organization is just celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. We were really the outliers and because we were approaching it differently. Traditional conservation was run by biologists. And of course, the science is very important. And we do the science also. But science alone won't save the species. It's a people problem. You have to deal with the people. Obviously, biology and studying the bonobos is something very important. But the threats are the people. And the drivers of the threats is basically the poverty and the lack of other means to make a living. So one last question. When you showed up in the bonobo territory, how well received were you by the bonobos? Do they say, oh my goodness, some new friends, welcome? Or were they skittish? Did they resist you? Or did they take you in? Well, I feel very welcomed by the bonobos that I've had the privilege to be with in the forest. There's different experiences. Bonobos that are habituated to human presence, and that takes maybe even up to a decade to do, which we've done, who are used to being followed and tracked. And they're as curious about us as we are about them. And they're also super sensitive to our body language and our way of being. You know, I've noticed real differences in the behavior of the bonobos toward us depending on who's in the group and how they're being. For example, we usually go out before dawn to find the bonobos in their night nest. We'll take some coffee and some snacks and bonobos share food. It's one of their favorite activities. They love to watch, you know, if you're sitting there drinking some coffee and having a little snack and talking to each other, they just think that's really cool. And they'll come close and watch and the little ones want to come and join you. In other cases, we had a, a journalist one time who was a big guy and was wearing a bright red shirt and he was kind of stressed out. And But it was, they're very sensitive to our body language and our 
if we're laughing and feeling good, um, that's more their way of being. You know, that's that's more attractive. Bonobos that aren't habituated to human presence, they are more standoffish. I've been peed on a number of times. They might pee on you. Um, they're more likely to run away. It's a process of building trust, basically. So it sounds like uh, the bonobos would make great beatniks and bohemians and poets. They are the hippie chimps. They're all about make love, not war. <laughs> well, on that note, Sally, I'd like to say thank you for taking the time to do this interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I, I appreciate it as well. Thank you very much. So there you go, my friends. Thus ends our conversation with Sally Cox. We now know more about bonobos than we did before the top of the hour. At least I do. I hope you do, too. One of the points Sally made in her conversation was how similar bonobos are to human beings. I've come across a lot of people who don't like to hear that. They say humans are humans. Humans are not animals. We're very different. I disagree. Humans are animals. We are our own distinct kind of animal. We have our behaviors. We have our ways of communicating. We have our ways of surviving. We have our ways of making things. We have our ways of promoting our species, and we've done a pretty good job of it. And we may have overdone it, really. We are animals, a certain kind of animal, human animal. I took a quick look online, and the first thing that came up was from the Australian Museum. Humans are classified as mammals because humans have the same distinctive features found in all members of this large group. Humans are also classified within the subgroup of mammals called primates and the subgroup of primates called apes, and in particular, the great apes. So according to the Australian Museum, I'm a great ape, and you are too. Oddly enough, that sounds like an advertising jingle for a Halloween costume. I'm a great ape and you are too. Imagine that repeated over and over on a YouTube ad. I'm a great ape and you are too. I'm a great ape and you are too. It'd drive you crazy after a while, but it's kind of an interesting idea. Even so, we are animals. Human beings are animals. And that's something that I find to be quite appealing and somewhat of a great relief to know that I'm included in all of the world in a way that's commonplace, and yet I'm still unique as a human animal, part of the human species. So one of the reasons I'm interested in exploring this idea of us as animals and the behavior that we express as we live through our lives is because I've been spending the last two months in Manila, in the Philippines, and I've been able to have the opportunity to drive in Manila. In fact, I've been driving a great deal in Manila during rush hour, late at night when the rush hour is not so intense, during the days in the business district, which isn't that crowded with cars and very well controlled. Yet outside of the business district on the four lane roads that are full of trucks, traffic is dramatically unruly. And that's also true on the narrow streets that run through the poor areas, which are packed with people, cars, small businesses, and most especially, lots and lots of motor scooters. Why so many motor scooters? Well, here in Manila, it's a delivery culture. So if you want something delivered to your door, you give a call to a restaurant or to a hardware store. The hardware store gives the item to the person on the motor scooter, and off they go, and they deliver it to the door. People also catch rides on motor scooters as well, and it's an easy way to navigate through traffic, the motor scooters. So in traffic, when you're driving in Manila and you're in a car, you're stuck in the traffic jam, which is often there constantly. Whereas on the motor scooter, you can take a different approach. You can dart in and out. You can cut through, you can wiggle around, you can go on the side road. So motor scooters are a really quick, efficient way to get around Manila. I seldom see people who are older riding motor scooters. Most of the people who ride the motor scooters are young. Most of them wear helmets. That said, it's a very dangerous proposition to be riding a motor scooter in Manila. And you never see motorcycles, only the little scooters, which I think is because the scooters are less expensive, they don't use as much gas, 
and they might be a little easier to navigate, although I don't know that because I'm not a motorcycle rider or a scooter rider. As I said, I have been driving in Manila, so I do have a sense of the rhythm that takes place when you try to navigate the roads and the highways and the back streets of Manila. You may be wondering how I plan to tie Manila driving into us being human animals. Well, the thing I've noticed most about Manila driving, it requires a great deal of instinct. In the States, when you drive, you'll come to an intersection, four-way stop, for example, and four people will be there, and each person will wait their turn and take the right or the left, go wherever they need to go. Everything is fine. Everybody knows the rules. What I've discovered driving in Manila is that there are rules, and I suspect those rules are somehow written down which means you do stop at a red light, you do make sure you yield, and some of the basic rules that you know about when you're driving in the States. That said, I've noticed that a lot of the driving in Manila comes down to instinct, a sense of timing, almost like a jazz improv, or coming back to the animals, almost like flying in a murmuration of blackbirds. You've seen the blackbirds swooping and diving above the trees in the fall, and then somehow on cue they all just funnel down into the trees and night comes and they sleep overnight and then off they go again the next day. When you're driving in Manila, if you're on a main road and it's rush hour and you want to get over into another lane, you don't just give your signal, wait for somebody to give you an opening and you pull over. Here, you give your signal and you move into the next lane, regardless of whether somebody pulls over or not. And the idea is to nudge until somebody gives away an inch and that allows you to go in. So it's a bit of an aggressive contest on one level, and yet on another level, there's a flow to it. Somehow, you know when the person's going to give and when the person's going to push and not let you through. And the other thing I noticed about driving in Manila, and this is coming back to the motor scooters, there are hundreds and hundreds of them, thousands of them, maybe tens of thousands of them. You can imagine, like the flock of the blackbirds flying around. Metro Manila has a population of over 13 million, so tens of thousands of motor scooters running around is not that far-fetched. And these characters are darting in and out, and they're going fast, they're going slow, they're going all speeds, and they're driving in what really appears to be quite unruly ways. And the only reason drivers in cars don't do what the motor scooter drivers do is because they're locked down in the cars and they don't have as much flexibility. Even so, the cars, the trucks, the buses, the motor scooters, they all are doing the same thing. They're flying like the blackbirds in the flock, figuring out how to get through all of this. So even though the rules are written down somewhere and you have to take a driving test, and know the rules, when you get out on the road, there's a different set of rules. Since I'm here on a tourist visa, I'm able to drive with my American license, which means I haven't had to take the, the driving test to get a Filipino driver's license because I don't really need it right now. When I first started to drive here, I was terrified of the traffic. I was so hesitant, so doubtful, so concerned. I would sit and wait and hope somebody would let me in, and I would sit and sit and sit, and I would finally realize that's not going to work. So I would nudge out thinking, this is the end of the world. And it never was. Somehow I managed to slide into the traffic and off I'd go. And it took me a while to realize that driving in Manila traffic was more like flying in a murmuration of blackbirds than driving on the highway like I'm so used to in America. I've talked to other people who've driven in other big capitals around the world, and they say that this traffic in these other capitals matches what the traffic is like here in Manila. I plan to return to the States in about 10 days from now, so I'll have to adjust to waiting my turn at the stop sign rather than the more um, fluid Manila driving, if you know what I mean. And one more thing that I've noticed about the motor scooters, and I think this is especially important for me because perspective has always been a subject that I've been interested in, how I see things and how much my certainty usually drives the way I make my decisions. And sometimes my certainty is off base. It's not accurate. 
So here's a shift of perspective. When I first started driving in Manila, I spent a lot of time trying to avoid all the motor scooters. I watched for this one, watched for that one, tried to brake, tried to swerve, tried to get out of the way, tried to keep from bumping somebody. Now, it happens a lot here. People bump each other all the time here, and the motor scooters do scrape the cars, I've been told, although I haven't had that experience myself. But here's the shift in perspective. I thought I was responsible for trying to avoid bumping into the motor scooters. Now, it's true. We are responsible for that, indeed. Vigilance is important when you're driving in this flock of traffic. That said, what I noticed about the motor scooters, they are so good at what they do. They can judge when they have an inch to spare. They can dart through places that seem almost impossible, just missing things by a tiny little bit. So I realized I don't have to watch out for the motor scooters because they're more aware of me than I am of them. I just have to be generally aware of how many of them there are around me and let the motor scooter drivers navigate around the cars rather than me or any other car trying to avoid them. I also have a lot of sympathy for the motor scooter drivers because most of them are out there for work. They're not out for a joy ride around Manila. They're pushing those scooters 10, 12 hours a day, delivering stuff to houses, hauling car batteries around, running errands, doing whatever they can to make their way in the world. Often when one of the scooters comes to the house to deliver some food here, I make sure I give a fairly large tip. What is a large tip? Three bucks maybe, which would be 250 Filipino pesos. Three dollars is a lot of money here. People who work start somewhere around nine or ten dollars a day if they're just working small labor jobs that have no consequence. And they can go up to twenty-five dollars a day for upper level construction supervision. And yet even twenty-five dollars a day is not that much when you think of how long the days are. And the other thing about the scooters with all the drivers running around all over town, Manila is hot. It's very warm here. 90 degrees most days. It cools down to 70. I like it, especially since I'm not in the States in the wintertime. And yet, I'm not always outside. I'm in air conditioning situations. Whereas these drivers, they're out there all the time, blasting around in the flock of the traffic. So, my perception of having to be careful around the drivers? Sure, I need to be careful. Manila traffic is very different than American traffic. Vigilance requires a different kind of tuning, if you will. That said, I don't have to pay that much attention to those drivers because they are driving in a collective flock consciousness, just like I am. And the moment I figured that out and started to apply my fascination with the murmuration of blackbirds, apply the idea that instinct plays a big role in Manila driving. The idea that the instinct comes from the animal side of me, not from the rational side of me. When I started to apply all that, I thought, yeah, I get it. Driving in Manila is an okay thing. And I'm sure that if I ran into a bonobo somewhere in the Congo, maybe we might have some sensibilities that we could share. But I don't know, I've not been to the Congo and I've not seen any bonobos lately, but I have seen some Manila traffic. And on that note, I think that brings us around to the end of this show. Hey, thank you for taking the drive with me. I really appreciate telling the road story and I'm glad Sally was able to fill us in on the bonobos and I'm glad that you're here listening to this show wherever you are. I really, really am glad you've been tuning in to Twice Five Miles Radio, fertile ground for conversations worth listening to and remembering. I am your host, James Nave, always airing this show first on WPVMLP Asheville 103.7 and streaming online, WPVMFM.org, the voice of Asheville heard all over the world and on other community radio stations like KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio coming out of Taos, New Mexico. Thank you, Walter Parks, for our theme song, WalterParks.com. For more on Walter's music, 
David and Dio, thank you for managing WPVMFM on Wall Street in downtown Asheville. And Robin Collier, thank you for managing KCEI in Taos, New Mexico. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to reach out to me, I would love to hear from you. Nave at jamesnave.com. Nave is spelled N-A-V-E. And I'd like to remind you that we are sponsored by the Imaginative Storm Writing Project. If you would like to improve your writing chops, you can always go to imaginativestorm.com. And there you will find lots and lots of tips for how to do just that. And before we go, I'm going to give you a little short poem I wrote using the Imaginative Storm method. Is it late enough? Or do I still have time to arrive at the image I glanced of myself years ago, before the circus, before the work, before my etched face? I was too young to understand how to let you look at me, let you pay attention, let you stare. I'll let you now. Do you see the spots on my face? Can I stay still enough, long enough to feel your eyes on my skin? Am I a moment looking for a place in your memory? Can you recall the last time you and I spoke to the air? Will you think of me after the dance fades? Is it late enough to be new again? Hey, thanks for listening to Twice Five Miles Radio. Hope you come back and tune in again sometime soon. Till then, I'll catch you on that turnaround somewhere down the line.